What is happening right now? How are you, dude? Switch mics. Totally improv right now. Oh, this is a Miami song? No. No. That's a song by Camp Mountain Choir. Yos- hey, look. Yosef Rotelsky and, and the Hebra. I don't know. It just stuck in my head. Good for you. Kiamti. What does Kiamti mean? Good for you. Right? Good for me that it's... No, that you want to do that. Yeah. Are you like shame, Keshi? Kiamti? What's Kiamti? I upheld. I am notoriously I bad with words of songs. You guys, anybody who knows me, I will mess up like literally every song. Vizakini, like, you know, like if there was a Modani song, I'd mess it up. There's, nice. a, there's a Modani song. Anyways, welcome to this special edition episode of Meaningful People Podcast. If you're listening to Sahala Might, then like, come on, put your phone down, spend time with your kids, go to Six Flags. Maybe you're on the way to Six Flags. Nice. And if you are, good luck. It's going to be fun. It's going to be very exciting. Um, but kids, behave. And you're about to listen to an awesome podcast with a Talmud and a Rebbe. Lior Galili sitting down with his Rebbe, Rebbe Yusuf Berkowitz, and having a really, really open, honest discussion, hashkafic discussion. And it's so important for for everyone to hear this. And that's why we're putting it out there. Um, and yeah, anything to add, Mamonis? Yeah, I mean, Rebbe Yusuf Berkowitz is a godol bedoireinu mamish. He's a tremendous, tremendous mechanech. And a Gadol Yisrael, and his work in the Jerusalem Kollel. If you're working with someone in Kirov or as a, a rov in an out of town location, it's very, very likely that they're either a direct Talmud of Yitzchak Berkowitz from the Jerusalem Kollel, or very highly influenced by his Torah yeah. and what he's doing. And of course, Eshat Torah, everything that Eshat Torah is doing um, with Yitzchak Berkowitz now as the Rosh Hashiva, it's unbelievable how such a massive Gadol Batayra is at the helm of Aisha Taira and really maximizing and realizing Rav Noach Weinberg's vision that he put forth for yeah. Aisha Taira. It's, it's really incredible. And we hope to have Rav Yitzhak Berkowitz on Meaningful People one day as a guest and dive into his story and hear about his life. This episode is not that. It's more about things that pertain to us, topics, Jewish life, if you're a parent, if you're a teen. Um, so go ahead, dive into this episode. Really hope you enjoy. I think you will. And if you do, pass it on to a friend because sharing is caring and sharing is fun. Matthew's on like a karaoke Indian. Listen, listen, yes. Yes, there's actually a, we have an advertiser coming up called J Karaoke. It's a Jewish karaoke company. Oh, nice. Yeah, we'll touch upon that soon. It's pretty cool. Anyways, uh, we hope you enjoy this episode and we'll see you on the flip side. Today, we have the huge zechus of being joined here by my Rebbe, Rabbi Yitzchak Berkowitz Shlita. Rebbe, first of all, welcome to the podcast, and thank you so much for joining us here today. Great being here. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. So with Rebbe's permission, we'd like to just jump right in and get straight to the questions. So Rebbe, Western society has drastically changed its values over the past decade or even two decades, and we want to know from Rebbe, how would Rebbe say that that has affected Kalal Yisrael? Well, first, we've got to understand what Western society is built on today. Oh, what are their beliefs? What's their whole belief system? Uh, Western society is built on, I guess, contemporary philosophy, that of Kant, which is, as he put it, the only thing we know for sure is that we don't know anything for sure. Meaning the negation of the whole notion of absolute truth. There is no absolute truth. Um, they've taken it a bit further. And that is that there is absolutely absolute, <laughs> no absolute truth. Um, as a result of that, Everything is a manner of, I guess, societal convention. Whatever society accepts is acceptable, whatever not, not. And then the more you push and the more you allow society to drift, the more becomes part of your truth and value system. Along with that comes the idea that you can never negate someone else's beliefs. You've got to accept them. You've got to respect them. Nobody can ever be challenged to have to defend his beliefs because beliefs are not based on anything rational because there is no absolute truth. Beliefs are whatever you feel like believing in. So you've got to accept whatever it is that anyone feels like believing in. Uh, And if you don't, then there's something wrong with you. If you don't, you're a fascist. This is really what's underlying. Of course, what's happened is, yes, they've pushed the norms and anything goes. And uh, if you're 
one of those who speaks up in favor of what society once believed in, you're not only outdated, but there's this, uh, the, there's this cancel culture, which means you're not relevant. You're not relevant. This is really, this is really what it is based on. Um, uh, as a result of that, uh, we too have picked up certain, uh, uh, um, certain liberal values. Um, I guess the idea of respecting things and we feel uncomfortable with the notion of something being absolute, certainly where it negates other, other people and other people's beliefs. Um, I believe that uh, many of us today have a hard time accepting the, mor the morality of Torah itself because we're moral than Torahs. We're part of a society that is progressive and has surpassed the Torah's values. Um, I don't know if people will say that in so many words, but they feel that way. There are parashies in the Torah that people feel very uncomfortable with today as a, as a result of it. Whether they'll voice it, whether they won't voice it, uh, but I think our own, because we really have bought into society's ideas that anything goes and that you've got to respect everybody equally and no one person has the right to impose his views on anyone else. Wow. So it sounds like Rebbe is saying that this effect really affects us whether we're conscious of it or not. So I'd want to ask Rebbe, how does, how does that affect us on a practical living, like on a practical level, living every day with these influences going on around us? Well, the question is first, how seriously do you, do you take the Torah? I mean, let me, ask, let me ask a very, very simple question. When you learn the Parsha of Aval, you learn Parsha's Mishpatim in the Torah. What do you tell yourself? Well, either you're not thinking, either you're just not thinking about it altogether, um, or, oh, come on, th this is archaic. Uh, this just couldn't be. I'm not, first, let get it straight. Practically speaking, Dina uh, Mahusa, um, Western society has abolished slavery. In fact, most of the free world has abolished slavery. And uh, make no mistake about it, you can't have a slave today. <laughs> um, but when you, when you read the Parsha of Allah, what do you tell yourself? I'm open to hearing the Dvar Hashem, or I am judging Torah and I'm deciding whether or not Torah is relevant, deciding whether or not Torah is, is appropriate for our day and age. Uh, that's something blatant. I'm sure there are so many other subtleties. There are so many other parshies in the Torah where people really, really have questions. And when it comes to observance of Allah, also people, you know, will question, does this really, really apply today? It's not so much in sync with where, where, where we are holding today. So based off of Rebbe saying, it sounds like people today will actually look at the Torah and judge it and take a personal stance and say, does this make sense to me or not? If they're thinking in the first place. And if they're not? Which... Uh, um, perhaps that should take us to another, another discussion about where society is today. Um, I don't know if this is something ideological, but this is certainly something practical. And that is the fact of the matter that, is that technology allows us to access information in front of us in a, a, in a split second. And therefore, people are informed. If there's anything, you know, anything that's being discussed, you become an expert in seconds by just Googling it. You know everything. You've got all the information in front of you. The concept of scholarship, the concept of really studying something, understanding, asking questions, an in-depth study of anything almost doesn't exist for most people. Everything's a matter of statistics, facts, uh, whether, or not, whether or not they're accurate is another story, but they're all in front of you. People have become extremely superficial. So uh, with regard to Torah, if people are still learning and thinking about it, I think it makes them feel uneasy. I wow. think that there are parshias in the Torah that make them feel uneasy. Wow. Uh, 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 there isn't people aren't getting up and rebelling. Uh, once again, I wonder how many people are thinking in the first place or care enough to really voice it. So, Rebbe, again, on a practical level, today we live in a society that's trying to get rid of all boundaries, trying to get, uh, get rid of anything that's normal. Everything flies, and if anyone tries to take any sort of stance on morality, people think that this person has maybe an agenda or even just a crooked ideology, how would Rebbe say that a person could live, how could a from Yid live in a world like that today? Obviously, we have to go back to our basic values. Um, the, the Torah is based on the fact that there's a creator and there is absolute truth. And nobody has the right to say that he is more moral than Hashem himself is. Um, in terms of norms, you know, primarily start with the family structure. Uh, 
I, I believe, I believe that in a good from family, people understand the value of family and the value of why family has to look the way it does. Uh, I think family is really our strongest point. That is what is most threatened. And that's the thing that I think for most from Jews is actually least threatened. Because it's, it's really, it's where we take our strength from. Uh, I think what we have to continue to be machazik it. Uh, families have to be close. Families have to be aware of the fact that they're families. You've got to be proud that you've got a family. And family has to be the setting, whether it's, whether it's the Shabbos table, the interaction of family. But the fam that's got to be the fortress, really. That's got to be the place where you remember this is the way Hashem created and wants the world to look. He created men to be men. He created women to be women. He created a family to be a family where the parents are a man and a woman. The idea of, uh, the idea of Tznias altogether, um, I don't know how much longer it'll be legal to have a shul with a mechitza in America. I don't know. You know, you can say I'm a Navi Sheker. You can say I'm pushing it a little too far. I wonder. I'm speculating. I'm speculating. We've got to appreciate. We've got to appreciate that there is reason for it. We've got to appreciate that there, there are rights and wrongs and there are offenses, no pun intended, there are offenses necessary for the sake of us, to, for the sake of our keeping our standards. Um, these are things that we have to reinforce in ourselves and be proud of, not embarrassed of. And perhaps the idea of, of not being on the defensive all the time, but maintaining our pride. I mean, come on, we've got a proven track record. You know, our, our wisdom has survived everything. Our nation has survived everything. Uh, we have to be proud of that. I, I, I think that, that's of utmost importance. So Rebbe's saying that being able to take pride and having the Torah and to really, really appreciate what it gives us is what's going to help us hopefully not get like sucked into such an influence. The, the, the structure of the Jewish family and the Jewish community. So for example, just as an example of you know, what makes us proud, the world today talks about equality, respecting everybody. We're, you know, we're the old guard. We're, for, oh, we're old school. We're, we're the fascists. Go show me a society where more chesed is done than what we do. Go show me a society where people care for one another like they do in our society. Go show me a society that's as warm as ours. We understand you can talk all you want about rights, but people are cold. People are cold. You know, in theory, liberals should be the warmest people on earth. <laughs> no, they're busy with rights. They're busy with rights. The way I always put it is, you know, they'll, they'll demonstrate for your right to squat on someone else's property. Whereas the Frum Jew will invite you for Shabbos in his own home. That's a whole different thing. That's a lie. That's real. The world out there is very cold. But rights, everyone's busy being PC. You know, you got to be careful how you talk. We're, we're real. We care about people. These are, these are things that we're really proud of. So Rebbe's saying it's really the appreciation that for the values that we have is what's going to keep us out of it. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I want to make a couple of other points. You know, number one, Chazal says, Shani minus de mashki. You've got to be very careful when it comes to apikorsis because it's, it's popularistic. It flows. It feels good. It feels good. So many of the values of Western society today, in fact, the whole, the basis of it, so much of it is, is so flawed rationally, but it sounds and feels so good. If there's no absolute truth, how could it be that if someone believes there is absolute truth, he's absolutely wrong? Isn't that self-contradictory? Isn't that self-contradictory? That's number one. Number two, you know, you say there's no absolute truth. Not when it comes to science. Not when it comes to sending man to the moon. Or a spacecraft to Mars. Not when it comes to technology. If they say there's no absolute truth, you never know. You know, let, let everyone do what he wants. We'd never, we'd never be able to develop, I mean, develop the way we have. 
We understand when it comes to living life in reality, we trust our logical systems. We know what's right. We know what's right. We, tr we trust our reasoning. Come on, and that's why we, we've arrived at where we, we, where we have arrived at. <laughs> the, world, the world, it's surreal. It's surreal. The issue is that when it comes to the theoretical, their people want to say there's no absolute truth. So what you really have to talk about is what's real and what's theoretical. What is the most pertinent real question a person's got to ask himself? What would Rebbe say that question is? What are we here for? <laughs> what's the goal of life? What are we here for? So to go apply there, well, there's no absolute truth. But one second, what's it all about? What should I be spending my time doing? What's the goal? What's the goal? That's not a pertinent question. That's not the kind of question where you apply your logic. That's where you say you never know. That, that has to be the most important practical question you ask yourself. That's not this theoretical thing that you can say, well, you never know. That's not, that's not what today, you know, we call philosophy to me not real. I isn't this the most important thing? What, you should be, what should you be dedicating your life to? What's the goal? What are we here for? You know, if, if not for the fact that we're born where we're, our minds are underdeveloped, I mean, we're, we're born in a way that... We're barely aware that we're a separate entity. I don't know at what age they say that happens, that you become aware of it. By the time we grow into the world, we sort of take everything for granted. If we would be born mature adults, you know, you'd land on Earth. You'd ask yourself, what's it all about? It's just that by the time we're old enough to start thinking, we just got into the rat race and we're doing what everyone else is doing without asking ourselves questions. So, you, you know, what are you here for? Eh, that's theoretical. What do you mean that's theoretical? <laughs> what are you here for? What is the goal in life? You got to use your logic for that. And if you come to a conclusion, you have to be able to defend it rationally, like we do in science, like we do in anything else that's practical. And I'll tell you, what's underlying in Western society is the, the true number one value is not equality. The true number one value is comfort. And where this equality thing came from is because it makes us feel good, but it also allows us not to be challenged. If you don't have to defend what you believe in because everyone's got to accept you, that's great. You can do whatever you want. You, there are no rules. I can do what I feel like. What it's based on is comfort, and that's why it feels so good. Along with it is the fact that you're not challenging anybody else. You know, don't bother me. I won't bother you. So it's so appealing because it's easy for me, and it's so appealing because it feels so nice. But if people would only use their brains, they'd realize, come on, the most important questions in life, we're not answering, we're not addressing them all together. We're allowing people to get away with making up whatever they feel like, and, you know, you can't challenge it. You can't challenge it. Even equality. You know, the Founding Fathers in order to present equality as a value, we had to say that all men were created equal. They had to base it on the fact that there was a creator. If there is no creator, no absolute truth, who says there's equality? It's a matter of practice. It's, you know, it's a matter of practicality, not practice. It's a matter of practicality. It's practical, you know? Society is a, pra is a more practical place to be and a more comfortable place to be in if, 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 if you give equality. But the truth of the matter is, if there's no absolute truth, then equality isn't an absolute truth either. So what if someone else, be someone believes in tyranny? I don't know. Who says he's wrong? There's no absolute truth. And <laughs> you disagree. Maybe it is survival of the fittest. Maybe, maybe it should be that might makes right. No, if, if there's no absolute truth, we believe deep down everyone knows this right and wrong. We know that it's not just a matter of, of social convention. We know that. We know that. Shani minus damashli. These things feel so good. And once again, because we're in a generation where people are so superficial, and if it feels good, that's fine. And you don't ask yourself the tough questions. And you don't demand of yourself that things make sense. Then anything goes.
And I think, listen, the Jews really got to be mechazik himself and make sure that we're not, we're not pulled into this nice sounding stuff. And understand that there's right and wrong. And that there is a creator. There is a creator. I think most Jews today are embarrassed of the fact that we call ourselves the chosen people. It's so not PC. It's so not in. It's so not in. Ah, you got to study what it means to be the chosen people. <laughs> we're chosen here. We're Amsagula. We're special. In what way are we special? We got responsibilities like nobody else. Look at our history. We have to bring to the world things that uh, we've got to bring to the world <laughs> today more than ever. But the idea that we're different, yeah, if there's a creator, he chooses. And there's a reason he chose. We, we chose him. These are things that deep down people feel uncomfortable with, and we've got to be machazic ourselves and recognize that, that there, the world is so flawed in its thinking or its, in its non-thinking. So Rebbe's saying that living a Torah lifestyle requires us to think, to be challenged, and to really like, find out for ourselves what is our point in life, and these influences from the outside society and culture really help us like, almost take away that search for getting clarity and for truth and for MS. Absolutely. So Rebbe would say Absolutely. that's the most negative effect that it has on us? Uh, without question. Without question. So Rebbe, I want to ask, in reality today, unfortunately, like so many homes around the world, so many from Yidin, you know, if it's not the parents, you, you know, hopefully just the parents, but the children are running around with smartphones, there's computers in the home, and it's almost as if every home has some, even a small just connection to the outside world through the internet and through social media. How is a Yid supposed to not get affected by all those influences when they're all around the house or at a friend's house or it's so easily accessible today. How is a person not supposed to get affected by it? I don't know how a person can expose himself to everything and not be affected to it, affected by it. I, I, I don't know if there is such a thing. You know, unless you're a machine. <laughs> we're humans. Of course we're affected by it. You've got to make sure that you are your own filter and know what, what you should be exposed to and what not. In terms of technology, if it's Hefker, you know, if, if anything goes, <laughs> then you're going to be exposed to everything. Of course. But more than that, the culture is something, the, the, you know, the smartphone culture, where people don't, they don't work on relationships. They barely know each other. You know, it, it's, uh, you, speak to your, you speak to your spouse on, on the phone, you know, even though you're sitting next to each other, because you're both on your phones. Real relationship. At Aish, you know, we, we, we did an experiment in our Gesher program. We had, we had the guys go on, a, on a, an extended weekend trip, and uh, it was without phones. You know, the 60 or so students handed in their 120 phones and did without them. It was the greatest experience. They bonded like never before. They had a time. They were living life. They were living life. People are fidgeting with their gadgets all day. They don't have time to think, they don't have time to live, they don't have time to appreciate life. And of course one becomes very superficial because of that, because you're just, just dealing with information that you're being bombarded with. So yes, you got to decide what you want your kids to be exposed to and what you want yourself to be exposed to and how much you want to be part of that culture in the first place. Uh, of course there are needs, you know. I, Obviously, I mean, you got to do your business and your banking and, and, and a good part of your social life on the phone. That's the way it is. But that doesn't mean you have to live there day or night. You know, you go on a trip, whether it's a bus, whether it's a plane, there are people that spend the entire time on their phones. People don't talk to each other anymore. What's with relationships? People don't talk to each other anymore. I'm talking about in person. People don't understand each other. Relationships are superficial because of that. So much of so much of Yiddishkeit is based on really being there for one another, understanding one another, understanding oneself, and, and being misamic, thinking in depth into life and into everything you study and everything you encounter and every decision you make. We, we, we've got we've got to reverse this. We've got to see to it that Jews still think the way Jews think, and and, and not not be distracted by by. What did Paro say? He said, why are they thinking about leaving the country and going to serve Hashem? 
because they've got too much time on their hands. Keep them busy. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's what's happened. We're just too busy to think. We're too busy to think about anything meaningful. So we've got to change that. We've got to change that. This is really, with all the issue of Western values, and the very first thing is get ourselves into a position where we use our brains. And we're not part of that. We're not part of the culture where people are just too busy to think. So Rebbe gave us a practical step. You know, the first thing to know is that a person shouldn't feel the need to respond and the need to feel like a slave to the technology. For people, unfortunately, that already have felt to this trap of needing to feel like they need to respond and they're going to miss everything on the news and their life is on the phone and that made them sort of in a superficial way live life, how would Rebbe just give them a practical etza to maybe start to break out of that influence? Start with an hour a day. An hour a day of no phones? An hour a day of no phones? How's that? An hour a day that you're not available? And what should they do in the meantime? Of that one hour that might be so hard for them to do. Um, is that all you do in life? <laughs> you just live on your phone? <laughs> Is that all you do? <laughs> you've got a family, you've got a job, <laughs> you, you learn. <laughs> An hour without the phone, start with that. And see how good it feels. At first, it's going to be difficult. You, you feel like you're missing something, you get all nervous. People, yeah, The best place to start with is just an hour a day. An hour a day without a phone. It's going to be difficult in the very beginning. You get a bit nervous, you know, you get antsy. Uh, you're going to feel like you're missing something. So start with that. Start with that hour a day. And if you allow yourself to relax, and you allow yourself to do something, to, to do something, whatever, you're working, you've got family, you're learning, to do something, and whatever you're doing, put your mind in that fully. Just start with that. To be present. To, to be present, to be focused, to enjoy. <laughs> enjoy what you're doing. Enjoy what you're doing. We have time to enjoy, enjoy one another, enjoy our families. E enjoy, enjoy our work. <laughs> enjoy it. Enjoy it without always being on call. You start with that. I think it's a great place to start. You know, and then there'll be room in your mind to think. What would Rebbe say that a person should start thinking once they're able to start breaking away from such an addiction? It sounds like people that were caught up in it, their mind is always in the technology and always into what's going on now. So if a person is able to maybe distance themselves from that, what should Rebbe say they should start thinking about? What should they start being present about? So, of course, the first thing you do is you, f you focus on whatever you're doing. That's the very first thing. Focus whenever you're doing. For anyone that is learning Torah, come on. Learning means to focus, to ask questions, to think. Um, I would also suggest that if someone is really making a major change in, in the way he's living for that purpose, that he open up the beginning of Mesilla Sisharim and discover why he lives, what the purpose of life is. And think about it. It's, it's, it. This is so basic. Once again, what are we here for? This is so basic. And it's the underlying question that's supposed to be explaining everything we're doing and how we make our decisions in life. Shouldn't we be starting with that? You know, I, I, I would suggest that for, for every Jew. Yeah, I, I read Masuza Sharm once. <laughs> Oh, you should be, I had, we have Moser Seder. Oh, read it, focus, think about it, and ask yourself, how does this relate to me? Does this make sense? Is this right? How do I know it's right? Isn't that something to begin with? You're embarrassed? It's too basic? Don't be embarrassed. Be proud. Be proud, you You'll be one of those who knows why they're alive. So Rebbe would say the first step is to break away from the technology and then begin to think on a real level, what did Hashem put me here for? What's my yeah, point I, in this I started world? with just thinking about anything you're doing, just getting used to using your brain in the first place. Just being present in the moment. Just, yeah, and then, and by the way, enjoying, it's so enjoyable. People don't have the time to enjoy life. People don't have the time to enjoy life. They're not conscious of what they're doing. Live life! <laughs> Live relationships. Know your family. How would Revy say that the technology has affected relationships today? Ah. <laughs> relationships are superficial, cold, um, sometimes redundant, sometimes in the way. Um, 
They're not deep. They're not deep. They're not real. And they're not pleasurable. The relationship is not pleasurable. Yeah, it's part of the scenery. Because, cause, you know, you don't really get yourself into it. That, that, that's certainly one of the carbonos <laughs> Uh, of of, uh, of, uh, of of today's lifestyle. You know, it's, it's tragic, but yeah, that's where we're at. That's where we're at. People are just not, they're just not present. Not present for themselves and not present for one another either. So, can Rebbe give a practical aid stuff for how a person can maybe try to create depth in the relationship, even though they've, again, fallen to the technology and the superficiality and the mindset of just not being in the moment with someone else. Spending time together without phones. <laughs> Spending time together without phones. Two human beings without the barriers of, of all the technology. Spend time together. A family. All you together. Talk. You know, Baruch Hashem from Jews have a Shabbos table. You know, that, 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 that's a savior. It's a savior. For people that don't have that, people that don't have, <laughs> there's nothing left. So what you gotta do is extend the Shabbos table into the week if possible. People are busy too. But make sure it's only that you're busy and not just distracted. So Rabbi, I've heard people say that I wish Shabbos was the whole week because they're able to distance from their phones just because they're not allowed to touch it. But for some reason, during the week, they just get back into the habit. Once again, you create your own barriers. If you start with an hour, you're going to be able to alternate. There are times of the day I'm available, times of the day I'm not available. I'm no longer a slave to this machine. So Rebbe is saying step one is just to break away and say, this technology does not control me. Yes. <laughs> I don't need to respond. I don't need to go to my phone, even if it's a few minutes, an hour a day, just to break that constant feeling of a need to run to it and have to yeah. be tied to it. Yes. And from that, a person hopefully from then can build and just sort of break off. Yeah. So for our final question, we are joined here by Rav Ari Ben Shushan. He's not currently with us, but all the way from Los Angeles. Rav Ari would like to ask Rebbe our final question to hopefully wrap up the podcast. So Bechavo, take it away, Rav Ari. Shalom, Rebbe. It's Ari Ben Shushan. I hope all is well. A quick question. Being here now in Los Angeles, and really in America, that uh, Baruch Hashem, we have the zuchut of meeting so many of our fellow Yidin who don't know much about the Abish and sometimes are leaning a lot towards a progressive left standing when it comes to so many things. Is there a Trojan horse question? Meaning, is there something that we can either ask them or tell them that it goes into their minds and it's like a slow release pill? Meaning, you ask them that or you tell them a thought and it slowly releases in their brain later to really have them begin to think about their life, about their roots, about what they want to attain, begin to have a suffix in certain things and begin to demand of themselves. Is there something that Rebbe feels can be either asked or said? Thank you. Ari, you're looking for, uh, you're looking for something spectacular. That's the kind of thing I would expect from you. <laughs> You know, I would say the first thing to plant in people's heads is what's life about? <laughs> what's it for? What's it for? Now, the problem is uh, they've got lots of layers there. Uh, the answer is for nothing. <laughs> the answer is for nothing. There's no absolute truth. So the answer is for nothing. Um, plant it. It's important. But there's another one. There is another one. And... I don't know if people want to go down that road, but you got to take them there. You know, one of the untouchables in today's world is, is of course, evolution. Um, if you're a creationist, you're a caveman. You don't stand a chance. Uh, uh, you're, you're, you're a caveman, what can I say? <laughs> um, you don't have to challenge evolution. But there's one question you got to ask these people. You know your evolution? You know your evolution? Tell me, how did it start? How did it start? The primordial soup? Yeah, struck by lightning. 
they taught us, van der Waals forces. And then you got the, the proteins, the amino acids. And before you know, you got life. Yeah, and where'd the soup come from? Where did existence come from? Where did anything come from? What was the beginning? Science doesn't know. They used to say it was always here until the Big Bang. Science doesn't know what was before the Big Bang. Oh, they're going to discover the answer. They're just a couple of years away. Ah, faith. You mean it's a religion? I've asked that question to so many people. And they said they never thought of it. They never thought of it. They never thought of it. Isn't that, isn't that, isn't that something so basic? Evolution explains how things got from point A to point B. Where A came from, existence existed already. Finite existence existed. Where did it come from? I don't know. Well, do you know that the only people that claim they have an answer are the creationists? Do you know that? Something to think about, huh? I, I, I think all of us, all of us have to, you know, strengthen our, convic our conviction and understand that we're not behind the times. We're actually ahead of the times. We're at a place that science isn't. And I doubt they'll ever get there. I doubt. I know they'll never get there. Unless they discover Hashem. These are ideas you've got to plant in people's heads. And you know, you brought up this point of encountering people. You know, Ari, that's what you're into. This is something we've got to talk about one day. Is this something we all ought to be doing? Confronting people and letting them know that they bought into stuff that doesn't have answers. And they've got to start thinking. Ah, listen, Hashem should help. We should all use our brains to the best of our ability. Live sanely. Understand the wealth of what we've got and be able to share it with everyone around us. Thank you so much, Rav Ari, for joining us and for your wonderful question. And it looks like we have to wrap things up. Again, we would love to thank Rav Berkowitz, again, for welcoming us into your home and giving up your precious time for us today. And we wanted to give a big thank you to Nachi Gordon and the team from Meaningful Minute. And also a special thank you to our co-producers, Andrew Benner and Barish Ludmir, for joining us here today in Sanhedria. And a very special thank you to all of our viewers for joining us today. Thank you so much, and everyone should have a wonderful day. Thank you. Wasn't that good? Wasn't that something special? It really was, and I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please go ahead and leave a rating on this podcast. Five stars only, of course, because if you hit four, then parts of our toes start like falling off. Like it's just, <laughs> it starts, our, we just, we're like voodoo dolls when it comes to ratings. And we don't want, we don't want that to happen. I never know how that stuff works. Is that, is that how it works? Voodoo dolls? No, like with the ratings. Yeah, every time someone, hit, I, I don't want people to try it, but when you hit five stars, a malach is created in in the Shemayim. Huh. Look at that. And if you hit five stars, Kavana, a healthy malach is created. In color. In color. Very deep. Not in black and white. Anyways, we, we appreciate it. Leave a review, leave a rating, and uh, we'll, be back, we'll be back at you, God willing, Matzi Shabbos, Saturday night, the co upcoming Saturday night with a new episode of Meaningful People Podcast. It's going to be an interesting one. Buckle your seatbelt. And... Thank you. I get, you. I get it's is it yeah is it Cholamayid right now? I think right if you're listening right out of the gate, then it's Matzah Shabbos Cholamayid and tomorrow's Hashanah Rabbah. Leil Hashanah Rabbah. So get the shul early if you're listening to this right away. It's going to be a long davening no matter where you go. And shout out to the people who have like these Hashanah Rabbah sudas in the morning, like of course barbecues. Good for you. Appreciate you. You're holding up Klai Yisrael, and we'll see you. Adios, amigos. Thank you. <laughs>